The right choice can be different for different people. There is a lot of individual variability. There's no experimental design that guarantees with 100% certainty cause and effect. All of it is an inferential process. You always want to look at reproducibility. It's never one study nails it. End of story. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Gil Carvalho. Gil has a PhD in biology from the California Institute of Technology. Gil has a popular YouTube channel called Nutrition Made Simple, where he shares the latest studies on nutrition and health. In this episode, we discuss how to make sense of the conflicting landscape of online nutrition discussions. Gil, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, you have a very uh, nice YouTube channel where you, you know, what I've uh, come to the conclusion or my impression of it is that you not own or you you really like try to make people come to the conclusion themselves or like make the decision themselves rather than telling them okay this is what you need to eat these are the like foods that you that will be like good for you or bad for you or like you're just educating okay, this is what the science says and uh, this is what you know these are the kind of pros and cons of whatever kind of diet or whatever other health related information uh, you follow thanks man appreciate it yeah i i honestly believe that the right choice can be different for different people. Uh, it's not cookie cutter. There is a lot of individual variability. And so I think the only thing that makes sense is to provide people with the, with the highest quality information that we have. And then based on that, they, you know, just give them access to the information. Basically, that's all mm. from there. They can do with that whatever they want or ignore it or use it or, you know, that's that's not my turf anymore. But mm -hmm. I think it's that access that is missing most of the time. And people are given super oversimplified sound bites that aren't really informative, aren't really empowering because you can't make a decision if you just get a sound bite. Mm. So, yeah, and, and I, it's, I, that's like especially true on like. Instagram, for example, where you're like scrolling through a reel, you might get the first reel that says like, you know, apples are the best foods for you. And the next you scroll up, the next reel is going to say apples are killing you. <laughs> so it's like, you know, very hard for, you know, the average person yeah. to really, you know, understand, okay, which one is it then? Or <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe we can start with a bit about your background of, you know, how, why did you start making this kind of content? What is your background in this? And uh, yeah. Yeah, so I went to medical school, uh, and then after that, I decided to get a bit more training in research, in uh, research science, and I went to graduate school, and I got a PhD in biology, and did some work in physiological effects of different diets. We were interested in aging and factors that affect rate of aging, and so nutrition and caloric restriction and all these things are staples of that field. So we ended up doing a lot of dietary manipulations and looking at the effect on physiology and genetics and aging and all these things. Mm, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, and then after that, um, I mean, I've always had an interest in nutrition. I think it's one of the pillars of of a healthy lifestyle. And, and when I decided to do something in terms of communication. For the general public, I wasn't sure if I was going to do a podcast or or write a book or do. I ended up landing on the YouTube thing. Um, I like the I like having both the the voice channel and the the visual channel. I think I it fits my my personality better. I like to talk face to face more than just writing or more than just voice. And the yeah the the the, the nutrition thing I think was a a good overlap between things that I had an interest in and some background in and also where, where I thought I could add value. People have an interest in nutrition. There was a lot of a lot of doubt, a lot of frustration. And I thought there was a lot of scientific information available that wasn't being provided to people. I want to take a short break to let you know that I'm excited to announce my long-awaited longevity program. If you want to slow down aging and add healthy years to your life, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. I mean, my, my professional experience is overwhelmingly in research science, but everything I do, I always, I always bear in mind that I, it's, it's about the application at the end of the day to people's health. And that's one thing that, I mean, I've done research in other fields, uh, things like physiology and neurobiology and 
And one thing that I always wanted, it was always in the back of my mind was, okay, well, what's the application to people's lives? And it, it was never entirely satisfying to me if, if, even if it was an interesting scientific question, but if the application was too far in the future or not, no direct application to, to medicine or to people's well-being, that was something that was missing for me. So I think this is a good, exactly as you said, I think it's a good mix where, yes, there is the scientific side, the research side, but also it only matters if it's applicable to improving someone's health. Mm. Yeah. So we can like start off with uh, talking about why is there so much, let's say, conflicting opinions about uh you know nutrition for starters like I, I haven't noticed you know obviously in social media there's always conflicting opinions about all topics like politics uh physics and all other aspects of like science and uh, life in general also have conflicting opinions but it feels like in nutrition at least there's a lot more um let's say different camps like you know dozens of different kinds of um almost like ideologies <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, what what is a healthy diet or what is you know bad for you so why do, why do you think that this kind of phenomenon exists in 2024 right now in social media i think part of it is because there is individual variability some people have intolerance to certain foods that other people do really well on and so that right there you can have a a divide right you can have people that are doing great feeling great on a certain diet or a certain food other people that have a devastating immediate acute reaction to that food and are, you know, are understandably not going to welcome a message that says this food should be in your diet every day, that they, they, it doesn't work for them. So they want at least an explanation of what's going on so they can address that. So right there, you have a, an obvious source of heterogeneity. Then you have the fact that the research itself, there's nuance. Things are not completely black and white. It's not this... This idea that we get on social media, food X is poison, food Y is a superfood that everybody should be eating all day long. This is like a an over over simplification, a car, almost a cartoonish view of nutrition. Foods must be good or bad, and which bucket do you put them in? It's it's not that simple. It doesn't work that way. There is nuance. There is there are aspects like contrast of exposure. How much of the food are you eating? Right for how long? Uh, you can eat almost anything in a sh in the short term without without it having a massive effect on your health but when you extend this over longer periods of time that's when you see the biggest impacts on health and so that's not easy uh, necessarily to observe at an individual level uh you that's where a lot of times these large studies following people for long periods of time are useful because you want to know what happens in the long run uh and then you have personal preferences nutrition and food is something very emotional to a lot of people. It's something, literally, it's a visceral thing, right? It's it's something that you put in your viscera. So there's a lot of personal preference. There's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of culture. Food is intimately tied to all of this. And so it's very difficult uh, for, for, to, for people to separate what is a scientific finding from all of these personal aspects uh, and so I think that's normal in any of these topics, like you said, in politics and religion, all of these things have very emotional aspects. So these discussions are not purely abstract or cerebral. They, there is an element of emotion in, uh, involved there. Um, so, yeah, I'm not surprised that there is a lot of a lot of different views and very and people are very excited about it and very, um, you know, that the, these discussions sometimes get heated. I actually think that's a good sign. I think our enemy is indifference. It's not when people are fighting each other. Okay, that might not be very productive, but at least it's a sign that they care. They care about health. They care about nutrition. They understand that nutrition is important. I think our problem is that a lot of people don't care. They're not on social media consuming nutrition information. They're eating whatever is cheap and easy and and, and tasty. And I think the the uh, the epidemics that we have of, of uh, health issues and the the notoriously uh, unhealthy Western population in large part is because of this indifference or or the conditions that people have in their lives don't allow them the the time and the 
you know, the luxury of worrying about what they're going to eat. Mm. Yeah. And I agree that, you know, there's many different diets that can be healthy and, uh, you know, different people reacting to different or in a different way to different diets. So, yeah, like it's almost like they're arguing about the wrong things, like, you know, whether or not apples are good for you or bad for you, it doesn't really matter. Um, at least like in terms of, you know, because they still agree on some of the main principles like that, you know, apples are still healthier than Cheetos or uh, or French fries, for example. And uh, you know, they're just ending up maybe getting too into the weed of, you know, protecting their diet camp or trying to, you know, come out with some uh, like a novel information that would like, you know, be shocking as well to uh, gain more attention on social media and that kind of thing. That's a that's a factor, you know, for from the point of view of influencers or however we want to call them, health influencers or gurus, whatever you want to call people. And I, you know, I, I don't say that with a with a negative connotation because people sometimes will call me that those, those terms, and I don't I don't mind. If anything, I think it's a privilege. I think it's a responsibility. I don't think it's an insult. But yeah, there is an element of if you just say something that sounds contrarian that sounds iconoclastic if you say something that people have never heard or even better that goes against everything they've ever heard they've always heard this gets clicks this gets attention this gets even if it's outrage outrage sells and so i think it's a it's a kind of, kind of a business model say the thing that goes against what people have heard you get attention and a percentage of people will follow you and will do whatever you're saying, especially if you have some credentials. So this is something that's very common on social media. Um, and then, and then, yeah, that there's there's things that we can get into more in detail, in detail, like these different types of evidence that are genuinely confusing at first. There's many types of scientific experiments and many types of scientific evidence. They're not all created equal. And so it is confusing when someone says, for example, I get a lot of messages from people, messages from people saying, well, this is really frustrating. I'm so tired. I go on Instagram or TikTok. Every doctor says something different and they all have studies. I hear this all the time. So I don't know how to make sense of this. And the reality, I understand this is frustrating for, uh, general, for the general public to, to see the scenario uh, the reality is that it, that it, in science, studies aren't all aren't all uh, created equal. That there's there's different tiers of studies and different way different weights to studies. It's not all like a mm. mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, so that's maybe, something we can get into. More yeah, into maybe too. you can go into it. Like you know, how do the people know then? Okay, this is a good study versus this is a bad study, and yeah, what are the like the different tiers? Because you know, there you can like. When you're doing like some sort of a cell study or a mouse study, it doesn't necessarily translate into humans, for for example, as well. Yeah. Um, so to not to 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 kind of give a summarized view, uh, let's say for example that we're trying to figure out the health effect of something, and there's no research on it, right? So we're starting from ground zero. Could be a food, or it could be a, a type of exercise. It doesn't matter. Let's say it's a food. It's some uh, almonds or something like that. Uh, if we the first thing we can do is we can ask around. I can ask my neighbors, I can ask my cousin, and they might tell me, yeah, I eat almonds and you know I, I feel pretty good and I think I lost weight around that time and I, there's this thing that was bothering me in my in my back and went away. Okay, this type of anecdotal account is interesting. It's not useless, it's not garbage. Sometimes people exaggerate too, and it's everything is either perfect or garbage. It's not, it's not like that. It's useful, it's interesting, but we don't jump to cause and effect from this because there's too many loose parts, right? First of all, there's nothing's documented. We can't uh, confirm any of this. It's all up in the air. The person might've done a thousand other things at the same time, and those might've caused some of the effects and not the ailments. There's no control group to compare it to. There's something called placebo effect that's very well characterized. When people have an expectation that something is healthy, they tend to feel better when they do it. And then they psychologically attribute the benefits that they feel to that food or practice. 
it can also work in the opposite direction. There's a nocebo effect also. Bottom line, too many variables. We can't really, very low level of confidence. So let's say we go one level up, like you were saying, lab experiments, right? You give the food to a mouse in a cage and you watch what happens to the mouse's health. Interesting, actually important experiments. You can get a lot of information from this. It's just a big jump to humans. It doesn't tell us what the health effect is in a human. Okay, let's go to humans. You can look at indigenous populations somewhere in an island, right? You can ask, okay, I found this in this population somewhere in the Pacific Islands, and they eat a lot of almonds. They eat three or four times more almonds than the average Westerner, and they seem to be pretty lean, and they have low rates of diabetes or whatever. Okay, this is better than anecdotes because now we can document this, we can observe it, we can study it. Uh, still a lot of moving parts, still too many variables. The, we're comparing these guys to the average Westerner. Genetics is completely different. Pollution levels, activity levels, junk food in, intake. I mean, literally a thousand variables. So we can't infer cause and effect. We don't know what the causal effect of eating almonds is from this type of data. It's interesting, it's hypothesis generating. Next level up, cohort studies. Okay, we look at a population in the same area. So it could be in an area of Estonia or in an area of Germany, anywhere. A population there, people who eat more and less almonds, compare them to each other. Now we can document these outcomes. We can have doctors following them over years. So it's prospective, it's not cross-sectional. We can have an adjustment, a statistical adjustment model where we try to minimize all the other variables. So we're trying to isolate the almonds, the almond intake, the, the, the variable we're interested in. So it's a stronger data set. It's, it's closer to cause and effect. Can we do even better? Yeah, randomized trial, right? Split people randomly, give almonds to half of them, follow, follow over time, what happens to their health? That, Everything else being equal, that's stronger than anything else pretty, pretty much because the randomization, at least in principle, does a better job of averaging out the variables other than the variable of interest, which is the elements, right? So that's a very quick bird's eye view of what we call hierarchy of evidence, which is this ladder. Um, and by, you, you know, you can, you can tell that the difference between anecdotes or studies in a, in a rat and an analysis looking at 10 randomized trials is night and day. I mean, yeah, both are both are studies technically, but scientifically it's night and day. Mm. Yeah, like a I guess a good example would be like uh, pretty much everyone has heard about someone who has had like an uncle or a grandfather who smoked and they lived to 100 years old and never got cancer. <laughs> but if you look yeah. at the epidemiology, then you know people who smoke they have much higher rates of cancer and heart disease and they're 10 years shorter life expectancy and I believe like in randomized trials if they do it like that uh, then they would also find you know those kind of same results so <laughs> just you know the ane anecdote is yeah like a very there's many things that contribute to the observation that the or the anecdote in the end yeah and we, we just released a video looking at the the, the so-called French paradox where in France, they eat more saturated fat than in some other countries, but their rate of heart disease is a bit lower. So it's this paradox. But we we actually were looking into this. In France, they smoke a lot, very high smoking rate, and yet they have this low heart disease rate. So again, when we look at these, eco, we call it ecological associations, right? Just looking at populations. of Here's the population of Japan. Here's the population of Spain. Oh, Japanese people live longer, and they also eat more... Tofu. Oh, it must be the tofu. How do you know? There's a thousand other differences, right? Their genetics is different. The healthcare system, their culture, everything is different. Yeah. So ecological associations are really, really loose. And yeah, they're hypothesis generating. We use them to have ideas to then test things in sturdier contexts. Mm. Yeah. And Japanese also have much smaller portion sizes <laughs> compared to America, for example. So yeah. yeah. Could be uh, anything. Yeah, there's many other things. So how do, yeah, like how do the, in the studies, how do they pinpoint that this is the reason for that, not whatever? Because, you know, humans living in the free world, there's, you know, thousands of other things that could affect the outcomes of the 
of the study. So like in this epidemiology studies, that's very you know known and many people criticize epidemiology for the, this uh, fact that it's very noisy or there's not a lot of you know things you can find causal association with. So it's still causal inference, right? You, we don't, you don't really look at an epidemiological study and say, aha, cause and effect is proven from this study. It doesn't really work that way. But so one thing that's very important are these adjustment models where you're going to try to, um, you're going to try to take out of the equation all the other variables. So if you're looking at, say, almond intake, and you find that these different groups, let's say the tertile, the tertiles or the quartiles of almond intake. So basically you're, you're splitting the population into people in order of almond intake, the lowest, intermediate, and then the highest. If you find that there's also a difference in terms of smoking, for example, or exercise or something like that, an obvious confounder, you're gonna try to do it. In, you're always gonna have a statistical model trying to correct for that and seeing if the effect of the almonds survives. And oftentimes what you find is the effect of, of the variable goes away after you do this correction. If it doesn't go away, now you have a higher level of confidence. There's other ways you can do this. You can do this with baseline stratification, for example. So you actually divide the population. Let's say, for example, tobacco, right? You're worried that tobacco might be an explanation. You can take your population and split it and look just at non-smokers and just at smokers as a function of almond intake. And you can see if the effect is dependent on the presence of smoking or not. So that's another way to do it. And basically you're gonna take all of this and then ideally you're gonna look at randomized trials also, and you're gonna essentially look at preponderance of evidence or totality of evidence. You're gonna see if all of these lines of evidence are pointing in the same direction or not. If they are, you have a higher level of confidence that probably this thing is having this effect. If there's a lot of contradictions, then your level of confidence is going to be lower. Do you have like an example where like the adjustment of the model yielded uh, like a completely different outcome than was like initially seen, like an actual actual study or even you, you can hypothesize a study? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's pretty common to see, for example, uh, if you look at certain foods and then correct for BMI, uh, and you, for example, effect of certain foods on uh, diabetes, right, or, or type 2 diabetes, on incidence of type 2 diabetes, uh, and then you correct for BMI, it's not uncommon to see the effect of, on diabetes become non-significant. Now, that's actually a bit controversial because you could argue that the, the, the effect of the food on BMI is what causes the effect on diabetes. So this is called something being in the causal pathway. And so an argument could be made that correcting for BMI is actually an over-adjustment, that we're adjusting for something that is actually fine. If the food makes you fat and you, being fat raises risk of diabetes, then that's a, a reasonable way that you get there. So that's kind of one example. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you could, you could, for example, you could adjust for socioeconomic status. Let's say that you're looking at the effect of living in a certain area, right? And risk of death. And you find that living in a certain area of the city, you tend to die more or than, than in another part of the city. So now you might think, okay, so it's living in that part of the city that makes you die, but actually you find out that people who live there have a higher socioeconomic status, they are richer. And so they have access to better healthcare. And so you, when you correct for that, you might see that the effect on death becomes non-significant. That tells you that it's not moving to that area of town that's gonna lower your risk of death. It's all the access that most people in that area have to other privileges that is probably lowering their risk of death. Does that make sense? I don't know if that was confusing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. And, but you know, how perfect is it in terms of like, you obviously can't do it a hundred percent, uh, or you can't a hundred percent eliminate all the effects yeah. of the variables. So for example, if you do baseline stratification, it's pretty good. If you split between smokers and non-smokers or between men and women, for example, or between, uh, you know, people with obesity, people with overweight, and people with normal BMI. That's pretty good. And if, if you see that the baseline stratification does not eliminate the effect, 
you've certainly taken another step in that direction. In general, you're right. Adjustment models don't eliminate confounders 100%. So this is, everything is incremental steps. Even a randomized trial isn't perfect. You can run a randomized trial and get a statistically significant result, and it might not be the, the thing that you think is causing it. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have two groups. Uh, you're studying the effect of exercise on weight loss, for example, right? So you, you split a, a group of people into two groups randomly, and you tell half of them to go exercise, and you have some exercise program, and the other guys, you don't tell them anything. And by the end of whatever period of time, the guys that you told to exercise have lost weight. So at face value, we go, all right, this is a randomized trial. We, we randomly split them. It must be the exercise that caused them to lose weight. Not in all rigor. Really what you saw was a statistical association between being in the exercise group, being randomized onto the, to the exercise group and losing weight. We're inferring that is because they were assigned the weight loss program, but it could be something else. For example, maybe these guys got assigned their exercise program, but they didn't stick to it. They didn't exercise that much. And the other guys weren't told to do anything. So they were doing their normal exercise. And maybe there was no statistically significant difference in terms of uh, energy output between the two groups. But they lost weight because since they were told to exercise, they felt, they felt more pressure and they ate a little cleaner. Right, One possibility among a thousand possibilities. Or maybe there was something about the treatment. These guys got more attention from mm. the research team. And so they ended up doing some other thing, uh, being more careful and losing weight for that reason. Maybe they were being measured more often. So the pressure was there. Right. The bottom line is, is there's no experimental design that guarantees with 100% certainty that you find uh, cause and effect. All of it is an inferential process of incremental steps. The stronger a study is, the higher the confidence you get. You always want to look at reproducibility also. You're, it's never one study nails it, end mm. of story. Yeah. It's always, if you have, if instead of one study with exercise, you have 30 randomized trials with exercise, all showing a reduction, or at least in general showing a reduction in, in body weight, and they're done differently, and there's different types of controls, right? And you control for the diets in some, but not all. Your confidence goes up even more that the, it's the exercise doing this, mm. right? So you do the, exper the experiment in different ways, complementary ways. You're looking at preponderance of evidence, and you're looking at balance of evidence, really, to, to determine what's the likelihood of this or that. But it's always an educated guess. Mm. Yeah, it's like, you know, the more different lines of evidence point in the same direction the more confident you can be in it because yeah. you know there's different types of evidence and repeated in uh, dozens of studies and uh you know it it must you know of course with uh this diet things it's going to be like the 100 percent accuracy you could be only if you have like this lifelong metabolic war study where you control all the calorie intake and you have twins and you like literally for the rest of their life control all their activities and control their physical activity and those things and then you might know <laughs> like 100 percent certainty but you know obviously this is impossible to do in humans and that's why we have to kind of uh you know like you said it's trying to get as close to it as possible yeah for all of these things that we take for granted that's the case for tobacco for junk food for the benefits of exercise, for trans fats, for you know all of this, all the poisons that we accept as poisonous, and all the things that we accept as health promoting, this is the case. It's never a hundred percent certainty, but it is the case that as the evidence accumulates over and over and over over decades, different research teams in different places in the world looking at different populations, asking the same question but in complementary techniques, and you keep getting the same answer. It gets to a point where, yeah, theoretically, in terms of scientific rigor, we can't say this has been proven and we can't say the certainty is 100%. But for practical purposes, are you going to smoke or not? I choose not to smoke very serenely. I mean, that's the evidence, there's so much evidence pointing to a, a balance of harm that for practical purposes, I think that's a wise choice. 
junk food, same thing, right? Uh, all of these basic uh, fundamentals of nutrition, exercise. Uh, yeah, so it's it's about making these decisions. I mean, if you think about it in our in our daily lives, which decision are you a hundred percent sure of? Virtually nothing. You choose jobs, you choose career paths, you choose who you marry, you choose, you know, what who you're friends with. You choose every one of these decisions is made with some information in hand, but nothing is a hundred percent. You know, sometimes you choose a job, it doesn't work out. We marry, it doesn't work out. Friends, it doesn't work out. I mean, all these things are educated choices. Yeah. So it's yeah. about and even and even then, you know, with all if you do have a hundred percent certainty about something, then even then people have the free will or let's say the the ability to choose, you know, whatever they think. They might want to eat some junk food, they might want to smoke every once in a while, they might want to, you know, stay up late or whatever, you know, because as long as they're aware of it, as long as they're aware of the risks, then it's fine. Like I'm, I'm not against like a sugar tax or something, because I think people, if they are educated enough, then they would know that, you know, extra sugar is bad. And if they care about their health, then they would read the labels and choose the foods that have less sugar or lower amounts of sugar. You know, but I would never like, you know, say that you should never be able to like have foods that contain sugar because i think i believe in like you know free market capitalism and i, I think it's much worse to like you know control all the things than than for people to uh make poor uh, let's say because you know everyone pretty much knows that excess sugar is bad but there some people still choose to uh consume it yeah i mean i agree with that in general making giving people the tools to make an informed choice and lots of people smoke and understand the the implications, and I don't think that's a, that the choice is wrong. It could be right for them. If mm. they're choosing, if their pleasure in smoking is so significant that it trumps the, the future risk, it could be the right choice for them. It could be that that balance is favorable for them. It's not the right choice for me, but you know, it's, mm. we're not all the same. So yeah. I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately with smoking, there's also the addiction part <laughs> and with junk food, yeah. I, I think, with junk food, especially, it's yeah, pretty addictive, and a lot of people, you know, still still consume it and not not be able to control uh, their food intake. Um, but maybe we can now switch into like, what are the things then that we, with pretty high certainty of evidence, uh, obviously, obviously not a perfect amount of evidence, but like high certainty of evidence that is bad in the nutrition realm. Uh, similar, like similar to that, that, that we know that like you know smoking is bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the fundamentals of nutrition, uh, and you're you're asking about the things that we are uh, wary of. Uh, we know with a pretty high degree of certainty that an excess of ultra processed foods is not a good idea, and the the average currently for, for the average Americans is getting almost sixty percent of their calories from ultra processed foods. Uh, that's not working out. So that's, we know that with a pretty high degree of certainty. Um, we know that an excess of sodium in the food is not great. There is individual variability. There are people that can, that are more sensitive than others, but populationally, we know that's one issue. That's That overlaps largely with the ultra processed foods because most of the sodium comes from these junk foods and packaged foods. It's less of a problem with whole foods or diets, uh, food that we make at home. Sorry, yeah, but so for in, in this example, like how would you, in the studies, how would you come to the conclusion that it's the salt or it's not, that it's not the processed food uh, that, uh, that is causing the harm and not, not the salt? Oh, no, I, I mean, the most of the salt in the Western diet is coming from ultra-processed foods. Right. Gotcha. Uh, the majority is coming from there. You're asking me how, what kind of studies have pointed to concerns of excess sodium? Yeah, so like in the salt example, like is it the processed food that is causing the harm, or mm -hmm. is it the salt itself? Like if you eat oh, salt yeah, from yeah. a whole foods source and otherwise you're you know exercising, blah blah blah, all the other he healthy things, is it the salt per se or is it the processed food that is correlated with right. a higher salt intake? Yeah, I see what you're asking. Yeah, so even when you do trials, for example, just looking at salt and salt substitutes. And you just swap that. You're not looking at a lot of junk food. You still see an effect on blood pressure, and even in some trials, you still see an effect on, on what we call outcomes. So risk of 
strokes or heart attacks. Uh, and then you understand also the mechanisms. That's part that's part of the totality, right? So you look at actual providing just sodium, purified sodium or sodium chloride, and you look at the effect on blood pressure and other other readouts, um, regardless of whether it's a, it's junk food or not. Uh, you see an effect there as well. Now, the the, the effect on uh, on blood pressure is not just sodium. That's just one factor. Potassium plays a role. So it's the balance between sodium and potassium. Uh, and then certain certain foods also have a uh, blood pressure lowering effect. So it's not all sodium. That's not, yeah, I don't want to give that impression, but um, excess sodium is one factor and becomes, the more sodium you have, the harder it becomes to balance it out with potassium. Right. But it all comes down to the, the total dietary pattern. Mm. Good job. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah. Other okay. things. Uh, the type of fats matters. The quality, so the quality of nutrients, right? In nutrition, especially on 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 the internet and these these forums, a lot of attention is put on the 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 amount of nutrients. How much how much fat and how much carb? Is it high carb? Is it low carb? Is it high fat? Is it low fat? That's okay. It's it's more of a personal preference, really. The more critical factor for health is the the quality of the nutrients. Is it quality carbohydrate or, or a low quality carbohydrate? And that's mostly at the level of refinement. Are we talking about, you know, ice cream or, well, ice cream actually is, is, has a lot of carb, but has a lot of fat as well. But if you're looking, for example, at candy or soda, those tend to be high in carbohydrate, but it's the wrong type of carbohydrate or these, these very refined cereals, for example, is another example. And then with the fat, the same thing, the, the, the quality of the fat matters. And so trans fats have a lot of evidence uh, pointing to being problematic when they're in, they're taken in a, a certain a certain amount. Saturated fat, if it's taken in a high amount, particularly from some sources, there's nuance as well in terms of the saturated fatty acid. But a high amount of a saturated uh, saturated fat in general tends to raise cardiovascular risk relative to other alternatives. Uh, like unsaturated fats in general tend to be better. Again, it matters where you get them. If you get the, your unsaturated fats from junk food, you're not doing a very good, a very good job. But uh, if you're getting them from, uh, you know, nuts and seeds and fatty fish and uh, vegetable oils and things like that, in general, the outcomes look better. Um, yeah, dr drinks is, is is another thing. Uh, unfortunately, in the West, a lot of a lot of consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, and that's a, obviously an issue. So replacing that with mostly water, but coffee, some coffee, some tea is, is great too. Uh, yeah, we've we've touched on most of the fundamentals. There are, there's other things that we can talk about, but that's that covers most of it really. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like it's the what you kind of compare it to is what matters quite a lot, especially when you know, talking about fats or the carbohydrates. So, you know, let's say saturated fat is still healthier than uh, trans fats or some, let's say, other processed foods <laughs> that uh, if you, you're eating McDonald's and fries and then you replace it with, uh, you know, whatever, pretty much. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything that would make your health worse unless you're literally like, you know, drinking sticks of mar uh, or eating sticks of margarine or something like that. <laughs> Uh, that would make your health worse uh, than you know replacing anything with uh, McDonald's kind of or this very high ultra processed food diet. So you know even if you whatever kind of diet you paleo keto vegan vegetarian uh, if it fits your macros if you you know go from the standard American diet to whatever diet then your health generally will uh, improve I would imagine. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, there's even some demonstrations that are very. Uh kind of striking there's these these experiments with the uh, the the rice the white rice diet i don't know if you've heard of that the walter kempner's white rice diet there's another one that's the twinkie diet there's a professor that came up with this and they're basically just they're trying to make make a point right so he basically this is a university professor i think it was a nutrition professor that went on a diet that was mainly these junk foods, Twinkies and donuts and things like that. That's, pri that's primarily what he was eating, but he limited the amount. So he was still hypocaloric. So he ended up losing weight and a lot of these markers improved. 
triglycerides, inflammatory markers, all these things moved in the right direction, even though he's eating this diet that nobody would recommend long term. So it makes some interesting points there that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the we can get uh, some benefits short term on almost anything, particularly if you play, if you play ball, if you play the game right, if you control calories or something like that, if you find a different way to restrict your calories. Same story with the Walter Kempner's rice diet. So he took people that were very obese and had diabetes and had crazy high blood pressure. He put them on a diet that was mostly white rice, table sugar, and some fruit juice. Not surprisingly, they lost a ton of weight. Their diabetes and most people tended to improve. The blood pressure came down, came crashing down because it's a diet that's very monotonous a diet that is a radical elimination diet, and you're not going to get 4,000 calories a day from white rice. So it's going to cap your caloric intake, and a lot of things are going to move in the right direction. But it doesn't mean that those are health-promoting diets for the long run or that we're going to recommend them hmm. to the population at large. So yeah. maintaining healthy body weight is crucial, but I, I would say there's other concerns as well long, long term. Mm. Yeah. I think in the Twinkie diet, he actually took a protein shake as well every day to like get some protein <laughs> to maintain his muscle uh, tissue. Right. Because, yeah, like in the long term, he would yeah pretty much go very catabolic and uh, malnourished. Um, yeah. Yeah. In regards to like you mentioned the so saturated fat that uh, you you said would be better to limit. So uh, what? How much? First of all, and uh, what has yeah, like what has um, led to the conclusion of uh, of that? So the, the 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 reference range is under ten percent of calories from saturated fat. And that comes from some meta analyses that indicate that above that you tend to get you, the risk starts to climb up. But this is average of population, right? The the, the reality is that at an individual level you're going to see a lot of variation. Some people can handle more than others. So and I I actually think that. The excessive focus on nutrients, I realize I brought up saturated fat, so it's it's on me. But uh, at the end of the day, I think it's more actionable and more more helpful for people to think in terms of dietary patterns. so if you if you just think in terms of what a, a healthy dietary pattern looks like, and you know if you think of a, the the traditional, the typical Mediterranean diet as sort of just a reference, it doesn't mean that everybody needs to eat that, but as as a as a visual, uh, you know, it's not going to be a bunch of Kentucky fried chicken and a bunch of lollipops, right? That's not going to be the picture of that traditional Mediterranean diet. So you're you're shooting for a diet that has mostly whole foods, that has uh, some fish and seafood, that has substantial fruits and vegetables, unprocessed plant foods, that has some lean meats, that has some dairy, particularly fermented dairy, tends to be tends to show better outcomes. Um, that's kind of the, the general picture that you're looking for. And if you're, if you're looking at a diet with that composition, most of these minutia tend to fall into place. You're probably not going to be getting crazy amounts of salt. You're probably not going to be getting crazy amounts of saturated fat. Um, you might still need some tweaking depending on the, the individual. Because some people are more require more micromanaging than others, more attention than others. But in general, you're going to hit 80 or 90% of the, the fundamentals right there. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, I agree that many people are just very sensitive about these topics that, you know, because everything is on a almost like a bell curve, like too much of something, anything is bad and too little of anything is also bad. Like too much oxygen is bad, too little oxygen is bad, <laughs> too much water is bad, too little water right. is bad. You know, and, you know, it, it, like it makes sense that the same applies to all the macronutrients as well. Like too much protein is called rabbit, rabbit starvation. Too little protein is called, you know, malnourishment or malnutrition. And, right. uh, you know, too much saturated fat is going to be bad and too little saturated fat. You know, um, many people, you know, argue about that if it too little saturated fat would be bad. But, you know, generally, like there's always like a sweet spot for everything, like calorie intake, exercise. And it's just like... It's just very people are, I guess, too delved too deep into their ideology of whatever diet that they're following that they're very like defensive about, you know, that that any 
any indication or any indication that their diet would be somehow bad is taken or taken very like very like you know defensively yeah i'll give you another example i was just looking at a, a study on eggs eggs are a big controversial topic right people I, i've gotten this question since the very beginning and i still get it are eggs good or bad can you just give me the answers are eggs good or good or bad and usually this is what you find on the internet some camps will tell you eggs are, eggs are poison if you are eating any eggs you're killing yourself other camps will tell you, no eggs are super food are perfect you should everybody should be eating 10 eggs a day and you, if you're not you're losing leaving gains on the table i mean obviously these are exaggerations but there is legitimate variability there at an individual level and so people depending on, on your genetics some people absorb more cholesterol from their food and some absorb less the intestinal transporters of cholesterol actually vary a lot from person to person and so this study that i was looking at is looking at the effect of egg intake on cardiovascular disease but it's splitting people by genetics and what they find is that people who have a certain genetic composition that have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, they are much more sensitive to the egg intake. And then the ones that are that have low to intermediate genetic risk, they have a modest, if any, if any, effect of egg intake. As you go from low intake to high intake, you barely see a, an increase in risk. So it's a beautiful demonstration that. The difficulty is you have, when you talk about in general, in generalities, you have to give people recommendations. You have to get, tell them something. But the reality is this is going to vary from individual to individual. And some people can have an egg every day or more even and be fine, whereas others need to be stricter or would benefit from being stricter, at least at the cardiovascular level. Hmm. It all depends on our makeup. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, the diet or the foods are just a means to an end to having good health. And in terms of like the clinical outcomes, then a lot of it is determined by like your blood work. So people react differently to different foods with, you know, cholesterol or triglycerides or blood sugar, or whatever. But there's very, a lot of variability between people in terms of how they respond to foods. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm like very physically active. I'm very lean. I can eat like, you know, 300 grams of carbs a day and <laughs> be with like very normal low blood sugar levels and without any issues. Whereas someone who has diabetes probably is going to do a lot worse uh, with something uh, that kind of a carbohydrate intake. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what matters most is what's your like blood work and whether or not you get some sort of a disease or not, I think. Yeah. And with cardiovascular disease, we have the luxury of having blood parameters that have been characterized ad nauseum and we have so much evidence on them with other things like cancer for example it's harder like how do you know if you're if you can get away with smoking or not we know that a lot of people can get away with smoking smoke a lot their entire lives don't get lung cancer that that's a thing but how do you know beforehand yeah you can look at family history that's certainly valid you know if your family members had lung cancer or not that tells you something but it's hard to know who is at risk. With cardiovascular disease, we have better indicators. So if your lipids are great and your glucose levels are great, your blood pressure is great, chances are you are doing pretty well and you have low, much lower risk than if somebody, you know, their metrics are all over the place or crazy high. That person needs to be more cautious, obviously. So this is absolutely vital information that, yeah, would be, would be crazy to not pay attention to. Mm. Yeah, and another thing, regarding the biomarkers and the diet is that you can like i guess you can modify your risk with your lifestyle as well like if you let's say exercise more then you can probably eat more carbohydrates because you're burning them more for uh, energy and if you have like some other healthy lifestyle habits that make up for some other dietary choices like if you yeah like literally like run 10k every day or like a marathon every day then you can probably eat KFC and still lose weight then you know what who knows what's going to happen in the long run but at least in the short term you can maintain very good health if you just you know quote unquote out exercise a bad diet so you can there's a lot of other lifestyle and supplemental and other like factors that you can modify so you don't necessarily or you, you there's never like a perfect diet like you have to follow 
a diet together with the other lifestyle factors and then you know follow your blood work as well to see how it affects your actual outcomes yeah it's definitely going to be a conjunction of genetics and environment absolutely you got to you got to play it's like in cards right you got to play the hand you're dealt mm. if you're if you're dealt an amazing hand even if you're a bad player you have good chances but if you're if you're if you're handled a really bad hand you have to be more careful you have to develop some skills mm. right so we talked about saturated fat um i guess the next thing we can talk about is like protein in general so like what is the because protein is also like pretty controversial like for longevity especially like many yeah. longevity experts say that you need to be on a low protein diet right. others say that high protein is actually good for preventing uh, sarcopenia and muscle loss so uh what do you think about that <laughs> yeah i honestly the evidence on uh, protein being bad for longevity I, I i'm not persuaded i have never seen strong evidence of that basically this is based on uh mouse studies and then there are some observational studies in humans that show a direct correlation between protein intake and some some outcomes like mortality. But it tends to be, often it's the type of protein or the source of the protein matters. So there's a lot of these studies showing that protein, animal protein has this, has this correlation with the increased mortality, but then you look at plant protein, you don't see the same, sometimes you even see a protective effect. So I'm not persuaded that protein per se is the problem. Maybe it's what comes with it. Maybe it's the the saturated fats and all these other factors. And maybe it's the it's a displacement effect of diets lower in fiber. It's even possible that there's other other factors. Uh, I haven't looked at that in, in enough detail to be able to say that confidently. But it's possible that in general, people who eat these diets that are higher in animal products and lower in fiber tend to have unhealthier lifestyles. So this is going to hinge on those adjustment models that we talked about, how how good are those? How good of a job do they do in trying to minimize the effect of these other factors? And also, do you have data from other pillars of science that point in the same direction, right? Do you have any trials that suggest a, a harm of excess protein? Do you have a mechanism for it? All of these things are gonna increase your confidence. So I haven't seen uh, any evidence that convinces me that protein itself is is shortens life. I mean, I'm open to it if it's out there, if it's com compelling, but I haven't seen it. Uh, the sarcopenia thing is certainly true. It's it's a concern of, about when you start getting to an old age, especially if you don't exercise, that has a lot to do with it. It has to do with lack of exercise. It has to do with morbidity as well. People start getting sick, different diseases, infectious diseases, cancer, you know, chronic diseases like that, that affect everything, affect your ability to exercise, affect your appetite, affect your nutrient absorption. So yeah, you're going to start losing muscle for all of those reasons. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, it is a more of a concern after a certain age, uh, adequate protein intake and, uh, and exercise resistance training, I think is very important. Uh, for everyone, but but especially actually, just we just made a video about that. The American Heart Association just came out with the guideline emphasizing resistance training for an older population above sixty, uh, because it's a population that tends to not do it and that loses muscle mass rapidly, and so you have these problems of sarcopenia and and uh, the falls and the balance and the mo the mobility. All these things are affected. So yeah, um, I. I think adequate protein intake is absolutely essential. I think sometimes it's people get people obsess over it too. It's like we get we need 200 grams of protein a day. We need 300 grams of protein a day. I haven't seen evidence of that. And maybe if you're a bodybuilder and you need to maximize every gram of muscle, maybe. But for the vast majority of people, um, I think the best evidence I've seen points to maybe 1.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. 1, 1.2 to 1.6 is a good reference range. The These studies point to 1.6, around 1.6, give or take. See, you seem to maximize your hypertrophy. Some people argue that it should be a little, a little bit more than that. Okay. Um, but that's the ballpark. 
um, for that's for maximizing hypertrophy, right? That's if you're if you're going to the gym, you're lifting weights, you're trying to grow your muscle, and you're getting the, the enough protein for it. Yeah. Otherwise, majority of people who don't exercise, they should. But if they don't, uh, one point two is good. Um, even for an older population, it's a good range. Uh, some people are are fine with even less. The 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 RDA is 0. 0.8. That's a bit more controversial. I think some people worry that it might not be enough for some individuals. And certainly if you're trying to build muscle and you're at 0. 0.8, you're probably not maximizing hypertrophy. So it depends yeah. on your goal. Yeah, yeah, that depends a lot on the goal. And yeah, with protein, it's like there is a sweet spot or or there is like a maximum threshold that they find, at least in the studies, yeah. So there's like no point in eating you know 300 grams of protein unless you are very big or like like unless you weigh like almost 300 pounds yourself so then it might make sense to maintain your large size but if you're like 120 pound female then you don't need to eat like 300 grams of protein it's kind of redundant at that point then you know you might be better off by getting like more bioavailable sources of energy from carbohydrates or fats rather than converting the protein extra protein into glucose <laughs> There's another benefit of protein too, uh, in terms of satiety. It is one factor that helps with satiety. So, yes, it has as has a role. For people who are trying to lose weight or to, or who who struggle maintaining healthy body weight, who tend to overeat, it's one factor playing with the protein uh, that can help can help achieve satiety and then not overeat. Uh, for diabetes management, also there is a role of protein in um, inducing uh, pancreatic function um also during weight loss there's a there's a it's important also to maintain adequate uh, protein intake because you don't you want to lose mostly fat mass you don't want to lose your muscle so that's another thing that matters um so yeah but i i think i think it's i think it's important i think it should be should be talked about i think uh, i think most most of the people that don't think about protein are the ones that need these messages and the ones who are already obsessed over about protein probably you don't need to hear these details i think that's the, yeah. the irony yeah yeah there's a pretty wide range you can get away with protein like you might not maybe uh, like make the 100 percent of all the potential of your gains uh, in terms of muscle mass but you might get there like you know 60 or 70 percent there in terms of if you fall into like sl sl slightly higher protein intake above the RDA like you know the RDA is probably enough to maintain uh, the muscle tissue and prevent frailty at least in younger people but if you're older then you might yeah need a bit more to uh, yeah. compensate for the aging aspect yeah I think that's that's probably that's probably a good approximation and carbohydrates then that's also like obviously very controversial like low carb high carb or not necessarily even high carb but let's say you know low carb versus eating even just moderate amounts of carbs like somehow it feels like the low carb has switched from not only being against high carb but being against any amount of carb that is above you know 30 grams of carbs per day mm -hmm. yeah i think it, it depends also which outcome you're talking about i mean if you're talking about weight loss i think we have so much evidence that populationally it doesn't really matter how much carb or how much fat is in the diet. You, you see weight loss if you cut calories in, in randomized trials. And we have so many randomized trials looking at this. You see weight loss with high-carb diets, with low-carb diets, with high-fat diets, with low-fat diets, as long as you can maintain people on a, on, a, on a diet that is calorically moderate. Now, at an individual level, it does matter because how do you get to moderate calories? Some people do really well on a low-fat diet and love a very low-fat diet and find it very easy to, to not overeat on those diets that are very low-fat and very high-carb. Other people hate that and do very well on a, on a very low-carb diet. And most people struggle with both extremes. They can't stick with either one. I mean, we see this in trials over and over again. So I don't, I wouldn't dream of telling someone who's doing very well on either one People who are doing great on a ketogenic diet and everything's under control. I don't see a problem. I don't see a reason to tell them to stop. Same for people, for someone on a very low fat diet. Assuming that 
they're also minding their future health, that it's not just body weight. But I don't think there's anything inherently uh, concerning about a very low fat or a very low carb diet. Now, should we tell everybody to go on those diets? I don't think the diets, the, the, the evidence supports that because most people can't do it, can't stick with it. They mm. do it for a couple months and then they fall off the wagon. We see this over and over again. So I think we have to present the options and we have to give people the information. Look, this is these are the factors that matter. These are the different roads you can take to get there. Pick one that works for you. Mm. I think that's that's what works. Yeah. Yeah, like many different type di type of diets and different outcomes or like different focuses on what they're trying to achieve you know like a optimal weight loss diet may not be the most optimal longevity diet or vice versa so uh but there are like still like some hierarchies of let's say things that matter like you know obviously in the top there are like you know avoid diabetes and avoid obesity those are the probably the biggest let's say factors that shorten your lifespan and have other negative effects on your health so everything else like the the macro macronutrient ratios and everything else uh, tend to be like after that like the first goal is obviously to like for like long long term health is still to like avoid obesity and avoid let's say metabolic syndrome and uh, diabetes yeah those are big big factors you definitely want to dodge that um and at the end of the day, with any dietary pattern, you can mess it up. You know, it's it's possible to do any name diet wrong. The problem with very low fat diets tends to be the intake of refined carbohydrate. We see this in trials. But people tend to fall to, to eat more refined carbohydrates. So that's a, a caveat. It's possible to do low fat diets without doing that. I have viewers who do it successfully and healthfully. For the low carb diets, uh, also some caveats. Some people go more on junky low carb diets. Others go on low carb diets and their cholesterol goes up a lot. All of those things can be adjusted while you're still on a low carb diet. So I, I believe it's possible to have the best of both worlds and choose a diet that you like personally and still adjust these key factors. Mm. And certainly on a, on a, on, on, let's say, on a, on a common diet that is intermediate fat, intermediate carb. The same things apply, the same caveats apply. Going easy on the ultra processed foods and the, the refined grains and the refined carbohydrates. That's something that we, I mean, that's an obvious, one of the big issues that we have with the, the, the standard Western diet. Um, and then, yeah, making sure that most of your foods come from whole foods. That's, that's most of your calories come from whole, whole foods. That's, that's a good general rule of thumb. Um, and yeah, the, basically the, the, the pillars that we've touched on. Mm. Right. What I think are some of, you know, we, we mentioned that foods that we kind of generally agree that are bad. What do you think are the foods generally agreed upon that are good? You know, obviously there's still a lot of people who don't agree with <laughs> whatever, or, you know, there's always disagreements, but what is like, what is generally like healthy food besides from the fact of, you know, not being ultra processed of, you know, being a whole food generally? Yeah, um, fruits and vegetables, there's widespread agreement. Those are healthy, health-promoting categories of foods. Uh, fermented fermented dairy it also has good outcomes. Fatty fish a couple times a week. Um, sources of unsaturated fat like olive oil, like canola oil, things like that are widely agreed upon as being healthy um, additives. Um, lean meats. In general, um, yeah, water, tea, coffee. Now, for all of those, we can find, for every single one of those, seafood also with the fish, for every single one of those, we can find a group of people that don't do well on them, right? We can find people who have intolerance to seafood, allergy to seafood, obviously. Uh, we can find people who have intolerance to some vegetables, uh, people who have gastrointestinal conditions who have a difficulty digesting them. So that's where individual care goes into, uh, you know comes in um and and trying to address those conditions and and tailoring the diets to individual needs but in general those are the foods that have the best health outcomes for most people mm. nuts and seeds 
uh, whole grains, legumes, all of those have great health, health outcomes. Mm. Yeah, still like whole foods <laughs> that uh, you can find yeah. in a minimally processed form. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. And what about like whole grains and refined grains? I think we covered it a little bit, but you know, there's like, they're like similar foods, but they're obviously processed in a different way and it drastically changes the health effects. Yeah, health outcomes are drastically different for whole for whole grains and uh, refined grains. Almost nobody in the West is eating whole grains in any substantial amount. If you look at the statistics, 95% of Americans under eat whole grains uh, relative to the re recommendations and 90 something percent overeat refined grains. So it's exactly in the opposite direction of what is recommended and what's shown in the scientific evidence. Um, one question that people ask sometimes is if you have, okay, whole grains are, the, the health outcomes look great for, the, for, for a healthy person, but what if you have Type 2 diabetes, for example, if you're, if you're pre-diabetic. There's actually trials on all kinds of different diets, putting diabetes in remission or improving diabetes parameters from low-carb diets to high-carb diets and everything in between. The main factor there seems to be uh, some, some weight loss, some moderation of, of the excess fat uh, in the body, the excess fat, fat mass carried. Um, and so there's different roads to get there. Some people prefer low carb diets. I don't see a problem. That's a valid option. I think, I think it's uh, some some health organizations already allude to low carb diets as an option. I think uh, it's it's fair to increase that emphasis on in guidelines because I think it is a valid valid way to do it and helps helps at least a, f a percentage of people. Uh, I don't think it's true that you need to go on a low carb diet, and if you don't, you're killing yourself. I think that's exaggeration too. You can you can achieve a healthy dietary pattern with with some legumes and fruit and whole grains. We don't need to be scared of those foods. Uh, mm. But yeah, if if you have type two diabetes and if you if you eat a bowl of oatmeal and your glucose skyrockets and you're dizzy and you're 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 you know you're you have this peak of hyperglycemia and then a hypoglycemic um, period. And you decide to go to to dial back on those. I don't think that's crazy either. That's a, a valid approach. And then when you when you get your diabetes under control and you you regain your metabolic health, you have the choice again to eat whatever diet you want to to introduce the whole grains or not if that's your preference. But yeah, I I think the these kind of very artificially polarized views that there's only one diet that's allowed and and if you're doing anything else, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're murdering, you're, you're murdering people and you're, mm. yeah, I don't, I don't really see the, yeah. the rationale. Yeah. It's just people identify these either like one study or some mechanism or something like that, that would, uh, you know, say that this food is bad or is not optimal for, some, for that, whatever reason, <laughs> but you have to look at the totality of evidence and the actual like outcomes in the real world of you know let's say for example if rice is bad then why is japanese people healthy <laughs> or or generally healthier than uh, americans right yeah i think i think it's understandable the confusion because diabetes is a disease where you your carbohydrate processing machinery isn't working properly that's that's true that doesn't mean that eating carbohydrate causes diabetes that's a massive logical leap. Mm. In fact, yeah. plenty of evidence that, that that's not the case, that yeah. eating carbohydrate per se does not does not raise risk of diabetes. And some, depending on the context, it might even decrease it depending on the details. Um, so yeah. yeah, as long as we know what we're talking about. Mm. Gotcha. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's a good point to wrap things up, like eat whole foods not too much <laughs> and and uh, yeah like make sure you follow other healthy lifestyle habits and uh, practices yeah yeah i would agree with that i would sign on the dotted line <laughs> well it was great uh, talking with you uh, before i ask my last question where can people find you and your work oh uh, yeah our main our main platform is youtube so the channel is called nutrition made simple and then uh, we, we our videos tend to be uh, shorter recently and go over one topic and kind of try to 
condensate things. Uh, and then uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. Nutrition, the handle is at nutrition mate as three. Uh, yeah, people are welcome to link up to link up on Twitter. Right now, those are my main platforms. There's a YouTube page, a Facebook page as well. If you search Nutrition Made Simple on Facebook, you should be able to find me. And uh, hopefully this year, I'm trying to start a Instagram and maybe TikTok. We'll see if I have the attention span to do it. Nice. And my last question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you uh, wish you adopted sooner? Uh, probably being kinder on myself at a young age, not being so hard on myself, understanding that our, we tend to overestimate how much we can get accomplished in one year. And we tend to underestimate how much we can get done in 10 years. So understanding that this, there's a, this learning process for anything. And if you just stick at, stick to something, you will see improvements, but it tends to take longer than we expect, expect and, and desire. Hmm. That's a good message. <laughs> well, it was a uh, great talking with you and uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Thanks, man. Pleasure. Take care. And definitely we'll, we'll talk. But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.